before we uh, before we sit down and endeavour to unpack the Word of God, uh, would, you, would you join with me in prayer? Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we do thank you that uh, you are the one who gives us understanding. You bring light to our darkness and we ask this morning that you would give us light so that we might see what it is that you would have to show us. We pray, Lord, that you would unstop our ears, that we might hear what it is that you would have to say to us. We ask, Lord, that you would soften our hearts that we might receive what it is that you have for us. And so speak to us clearly from your word. We pray that we might see only Jesus and that in seeing him we would each one of us fall down at his feet and worship him. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last uh, week, uh, you'll recall that we considered together the first half of the story that we will be spending the remainder of this morning having a look at. We saw how it was that uh, Jesus, in the story before us, in John chapter 4, in the first 26 verses, how he regarded this Samaritan woman quite unlike the great majority of Jewish men in his day would have. He spoke with her, didn't he? With a dignity that she not only wouldn't have expected, but most definitely wouldn't have been offered. Certainly not in a very long time. And certainly not by a man. And definitely not by a Jewish man. In a conservative culture where a woman was living with a man that she wasn't married to, she would have been regarded with object scorn. Not only that, it would have been considered entirely inappropriate for a, a Jewish man to sit with her and to ask her for a drink, or to ask her for anything, as a matter of fact. And yet that is precisely what Jesus does, isn't it? And we saw how certainly in that sense, the gospel really is a game changer. Wherever the gospel is preached and believed, followers of Jesus begin to display in themselves the, the character of Jesus, the character of the one that they follow. They begin to reflect in their actions the, the image of the invisible God. They, they begin to become a little bit more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit begins a, a work in the believer's life so that their treatment of others over time and, and sometimes even instantly takes on an altogether different approach. It takes on an altogether different shape and a, and a different ethic. That's exactly what happened to a man named John Newton. I spoke about him, you might remember, not all that long ago. He was a man who, for the longest time, was a slave trader. He was a man who, who made money off the, off the misery of others. And as the gospel began to shape him, what happened? Well, he began to change. He found himself working alongside men such as William Wilberforce to, to bring an end to it, to give those he helped put into chains their freedom. It's what the gospel does. And, and so Jesus, who, who is the gospel, he, he treats this Samaritan woman with tremendous respect. He offers her the value, doesn't he, that not many others did. He speaks to her gently. He listens to her as she speaks. He answers her questions so that she begins to wonder who it is that is sitting beside her. She begins to wonder who it is that is talking with her. Here is a woman who, in the words of Monica Lewinsky in 2015, is seen by all and known by few. Seen by all and known by few. Everyone has an opinion, don't they? It's easy to apportion blame and to throw mud and to pile on the shame. But the truth is, church, that no one has walked in her shoes. Everyone regards her with scorn and derision. Here is a woman who is seen by all and known by few. 
And the beautiful reminder we should all take away is that Jesus not only sees her, Jesus knows her. He knows her and he, and he loves her. He, he, he loves her not as the world loves. He loves her deeply. He loves her, doesn't he? He loves her, warts and all. He loves her compassionately. Jesus loves her. And before we move on, I'd like us to spend just a moment longer in verse 14. Verse 14, you see, I think is the, is the crux of the entire story. It is the beating heart, the, the verse that makes sense of everything that is going on between this woman who is an outsider and, and Jesus who is the light of the world. He says this to her. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, if you want to know the origins of such a statement, you'll find it, of course, in the pages of the Old Testament. You'll find it throughout the pages of the Old Testament, as a matter of fact. Consider what is written in Psalm 1, or consider Isaiah 49, verse 10. Walking alongside Jesus and, and listening to him and, and putting his words into action, you become like a tree that has been planted by a never-ending stream. That is to say that Jesus nourishes you. Everything you need to survive and flourish is, is found right where you are planted. And that is beside him. Now I want you to notice with me a number of things. Notice firstly that the one who gives is Jesus. What is given, in other words, is given by him. Secondly, notice that what he gives, he gives to whoever. Now this word whoever is a, is a word that has no, no boundaries. It's an open-ended word. As far as the east is from the west, that is the word Whoever. And thirdly, notice that what he gives is not merely temporal, but eternal. And so firstly, the one who gives, writes John, is Jesus. Now this is perhaps one of the most important distinctions that John, and indeed all of the New Testament writers, want us to hear. When it comes to to eternal life, only Jesus has authority to give it. It's not even the church who gives it. It's not the, the Catholic church or the Anglican church, not even the Sydney Anglican church. It's not the churches of Christ or the Baptist church. Now, those of us who have grown up in churches of Christ or in Baptist churches, we might find that a little bit hard to hear. But it's true. We may be messengers who point men and women to the one who gives eternal life, but, but only Jesus can give what only Jesus can give. Do you see? It's not some guru in India who gives it. The one who gives it is Jesus Christ. He gives it, church, because it's his to give. It's why when Jesus proclaims the gospel, what does he do? Well, he calls men and women to himself. And it's why the apostles, when, when they proclaim the gospel, they direct men and women to him. And it's why the church in 2021, whenever it proclaims the gospel, who do they point men and women to? Well, if they're declaring the gospel, then they're pointing men and women to Jesus. The gospel is not social justice. The gospel is not social welfare. Now, they may be a part of the gospel, or a result of the gospel's work in our lives, but they are not in and of themselves the gospel. The gospel, church, is the proclamation of Jesus. Why? Well, because only Jesus can give eternal life. That which we lost in the garden, Jesus freely gives. 
Notice also that there is no suggestion that Jesus gives eternal life in, in exchange for something that those he gives it to might offer him. He doesn't give eternal life to those who receive eternal life only in exchange for something that they themselves have. He doesn't barter with us. What does he do? No, he, he gives it. Just as he does with this woman that he has now entered into a conversation with. He doesn't say to her that he will, he will give her this gift if she first changes her ways. He, he doesn't say that. He doesn't tell her that in order to receive what it is that he has come to give her, that, that she must first of all clean up her act. He doesn't say that, does he? In fact, nowhere in all of the New Testament will you find that the gift that Jesus has come to give, a gift that, that only he can give, he gives only after men and women change. Not once. You'll not find that anywhere. What we do see, however, is that in response to the gift that he gives, men and women do begin to change. They, they recognise that, that what he has given to them is, is just so costly. It's just so wonderful that, well, nothing else matters. All they can think about is, is what he has done for them. All they want to do is please him. All they, they want to do now is to live for him. No longer do those who, who receive from Jesus the gift that only he can give, no longer do they think that the life that they live is theirs to live as they please. Not at all. In gratitude, they now live for him. They want to please him with what comes out of their mouth. Even their thoughts, how they think and, and what they think, they think in order to bring him pleasure. Do you see? Because Jesus gives to us that which only he can give, our, our lives begin to change. Such is the gratitude of those to whom Jesus gives eternal life. Secondly, the text reminds us that Jesus doesn't pick only the good people. Je Jesus doesn't pick only those who, who deserve eternal life. Who does he pick? Well, he picks... Whoever, whoever, church, is, is just such a wonderful word, isn't it? Whoever includes people like Samaritans. It includes people with, with questionable reputations. Whoever, church, means that young men who live their lives thinking of no one but themselves, it means that they can be chosen. You see, that's who I was. I was that young man. I put myself before others. The most important person in the world at 17, you know who that was? It was me. And when my children look up to their father and they think, I want to be just like him. Well, the truth is, if, if they knew me as God knows me, then I'd be the last person that they want to be like. And what there is of me that is attractive, what there is of me that is noble, what there is of me that, that is honourable, it's only because God is doing something to change me. He's enabling me to love as, as he himself loves. He, he's cutting away those bits that have no place in the new creation. Whoever, church, is just such a wonderful word. Whoever, you see, includes me. And church, whoever includes you too. It includes everyone and it excludes no one. One of the great talking points, I'm sure, as we, as we sit at God's table in the kingdom of his son, is how amazing it is that the person sitting beside us is, is there at God's table sitting beside us. We'll look at them and we'll think, how? 
How on earth is it possible that a person like you is sitting here at God's table? And you know what else is going to be amazing? That you are sitting there. And that I am sitting there. And the people sitting beside us, they are going to marvel that we are sitting at the same table as the one who is, who is sinless and who is perfect. And we'll think to ourselves, and they'll think to themselves, how can that be? And they'll recognise, won't they, that we simply don't belong there. And they'll recognise that they don't belong there. But, but church, Jesus says we do belong there. He, he says we belong there because we will be dressed in his robes. We will be dressed in the robes of a son. And we'll be dressed in the robes of a daughter. Why will we be dressed in the, in the robes of a son? Why will we be dressed in the robes of a daughter? For no other reason than he's given them to us. You see, he alone has authority to admit us because he alone has authority to grant eternal life. The truth is, church, that, that the only human being that should be sitting at God's table is Jesus. And yet such is the love and the, and the grace of the one who died for us that he welcomes us to sit alongside of him. And thirdly, that which Jesus gives is eternal and not merely temporal. Now this one verse alone should address any concern that the Christian men and, and Christian women who have ever doubted their salvation had. We've all been there, haven't we? How could a holy God love someone like me? Have you not thought that? I've thought it I don't know how many times. How could a holy God love someone like me? How could a God who, who demands perfection, a God who, who cannot stand in the presence of even the slightest imperfection, how could a God like that love a person as imperfect and as sinful as me? Surely he's going to realise that, that what he expects and what he demands no less. He's going to realise one day when he looks at me that I'm just unable to give it. But church, that's not how eternal life works. If I can put it in those terms. E eternal life is exactly that. It is life eternal. And because it's grounded in his perfection and his righteousness and his holiness and his promises and his obedience, and his relationship with the Father, and his death and resurrection, those who place their trust in him and who accept the free gift that he offers, they can be sure that they have eternal life. Not for as long as they don't sin, <laughs> but for as long as he doesn't. And church, in him, there is no sin. There is no hint of imperfection. There is no shadow of darkness. In him is light. Do you see? What Jesus gives to those who trust him, he gives not merely for a day or a year or 10 years or 50 years. No, no. What Jesus gives, he gives for eternity. Jesus doesn't only give life, Jesus gives eternal life. And when it comes to eternal life, it, it doesn't begin when they lower us in the ground. Not at all. It begins now. The moment you pick up your cross and you choose to follow him, you have entered into eternal life. And so Jesus says to this woman of, of questionable reputation, there is something that I want to give you. And it's something that no one else can give. 
And then beginning at verse 16, Jesus reveals something, doesn't he? As he sits with this woman who's, whose life is in a mess, having a conversation, as a friend might, might have a conversation with a friend, he, he reveals to her intimate things that he couldn't possibly have known, things that make her think, things that make her stop and try to change the subject. Now, we do that sometimes, don't we? Someone says something that makes us feel uncomfortable, and so what do we do? Well, if you're anything like me, you change your subject. And so we read in verses 16 to 20 these words. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Well, Jesus, if he, if he didn't have her full attention before, now he does. He, he, he says, in, in, says in effect, I know who you are. I know who you are and I want to talk with you. I know how you're living and I want to talk with you. And, and by the way, there's something about you, there's, there, there's nothing about you, I should say, that, that would make me think any less of you. Church, let me ask you a question. What would you do if, upon being beginning a, a conversation with a stranger, they told you about some intimate aspect of your life that you were ashamed of? Would you ignore them, perhaps? Would you pick up your belongings and move elsewhere? Would you try and deny it? Well, there's a good chance that's what we'd all do. Is that not true? What does she do? Well, she changes the subject, doesn't she? She, she? she tries to change the course of the conversation. And so she does two things. Firstly, she acknowledges one aspect of Jesus' authority. I can see that you are a prophet. That's what she says. The only way that you could possibly know what you know, in other words, is that God told you. Remember, this is the first century. She doesn't have a Facebook page that details her history. How then does he know? Well, he must be a prophet. That's the conclusion that this Samaritan woman comes to. And so little by little, the scales are beginning to drop. She, she doesn't yet have a complete picture of who it is that she's talking to. She, she still doesn't know that the one she is sitting beside is the one who created her, the one who made her. She doesn't yet appreciate that one day she'll have, an, have to give an account to the one who's sitting beside her, the one, the one who purposed her into being and who chose to come to the well that she draws water from at the exact time that she herself would be there. But the light is beginning to dawn, isn't it? The scales are beginning to drop from her eyes. Now, there will be times, church, when the, when the full majesty of who Jesus is opens a person's eyes in a blinding flash of light. And it happened to my mum, exactly like that. Her whole life, she didn't know him. She could have walked right by him and not known that the one that she walked past is the very one who made her. And in an instant, as she listened to the gospel, the Spirit of God moved upon her and at that very moment, my mum knew who he was. She didn't understand the full majesty of who he was, but she knew as, as if like a blinding flash of light, God at that very moment inscribed it upon her heart. And that's exactly what he did. But for a great many people, Jesus reveals himself gradually, bit by bit. We, we discover something new, don't we? Yesterday, we didn't know anything at all about him. Today, we, we see perhaps something that we hadn't seen before, a word spoken, perhaps, a need, 
that he answers. And bit by bit, he reveals himself to us until finally we bend the knee. We recognize that he is, in fact, above us and he is beyond us. We discover that he is not answerable to us, but that we, in fact, are, are answerable to him. No two conversations are quite the same. The, the way he reveals himself to me is very different to the way he may reveal himself to you. And as this woman listens to the man who sits beside her, she begins to, to recognize that, well, he's, he's more than just a man. He's a prophet. And the scales are beginning to fall. Secondly, if he's a prophet, then maybe he can settle once and for all where God's people are to worship. Now, why she goes here, we don't really know, do we? Perhaps he wants to show him that although she's a woman who has a reputation, she's living with a man that she isn't married to, she is, however, concerned with spiritual things. Perhaps she thinks that, that if this man really is a prophet, she'd better talk about things that, that matter to him. Now, the exact thing has happened to me on, on more than one occasion, I've got to tell you. When the question, what do you do, comes up, people either don't know what to talk about or else they ask me a question about the church or ev even ask me questions about, about Israel. Are they really interested? Probably not. It's why most people find an excuse to walk away. But this woman, I think she really is interested. I, I, I think she really does want to know. If a prophet is willing to speak with her, then, then maybe God isn't finished with her. Is it here in Samaria? Or is it in Judah, in Jerusalem? Where, sir, do we worship? It's one of the reasons why why Jews and Samaritans hated each other. When the kingdom of Israel split in, in 930 BC, the northern kingdom, ruled by a man named uh, Jeroboam, who wasn't of David's line, he instituted a new place of worship in Samaria so that people wouldn't continue to cross the border back into Jerusalem. The southern kingdom, however, they remained loyal to the house of David and they continued to worship God in the temple. And so she asks this prophet, where should we worship? Where do we go to find God? Now listen carefully to Jesus' reply. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. Can I just, uh, for a moment... Speak on a point that Jesus here makes, a point that is in many ways incidental to the main point that Jesus is here making. Jesus makes the point that it is entirely possible to worship and yet not know the God to whom all true worship belongs. Jesus doesn't deny the fact that this woman, this, this Samaritan woman with a reputation, Jesus doesn't deny the fact that this woman is a, is a worshipper. Did you notice that? And not only is she a worshipper, but so are the people that she belongs to. The Samaritans, says Jesus, are worshippers. You Samaritans, that's what he says. And Jesus also says that, that being a worshipper does not in and of itself mean anything. Did you know that? Worship doesn't have any lasting value if our worship is ill-informed, if it's directed away from the living God. The world, says Jesus, is full of worshippers. And even though it's full of worshippers, that same world is under God's condemnation. That was the point that John establishes in the third chapter of his gospel. God loves the world. 
But it's a world, says John, that is under God's condemnation. Why? Well, because it's turned away from worshipping the living God and is in turned instead to other gods. Now, there will be those who say, yeah, but, but I don't worship any god. I'm secular. There's a lovely word, isn't it? Secular. I don't worship any god. I'm, I'm secular. I don't worship God. Not the God of Christians nor any other God because I don't believe in God. To which Jesus would say, don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. Everyone, says Jesus, is a worshipper. We all worship something, if not someone. We start with ourselves and, and from there we collect a whole range of gods that we voluntarily bow down to. Now we can deny that all we like. We can say that we're not like that at all. There is no one, not a single man or woman, who doesn't know what it means to worship. And church, I believe that with every ounce of my being. I believe it not only because I see it, I believe it because the Bible says that that's what we do. We were created, every one of us, to worship. My sister, whom I love dearly, a woman who wouldn't dare step inside a Christian church and choose to sit at the feet of Jesus, she is a worshipper. The problem isn't that she doesn't worship. The problem, church, is that she doesn't worship the living God. She worships all right. Everyone worships. But what Jesus is after, what, what God is after, are true worshippers, worshippers who worship the one true and living God. And unless we listen to Jesus, unless we begin with Jesus and end with Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, unless we worship him, whatever else we worship, what it is not is the true and living God. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. And so Jesus settles once and for all that it's not Samaria or, or anyone else for that matter who have the answers. It's the Jews. When it comes to worship and salvation, the Jews have the answer says Jesus, as to how it is that men and women can be saved. The Jews, says Jesus, have the answer as to how it is that, that fallen men and women, all men and women, can come into the presence of a holy God and not be crushed the moment they do so. Jesus says that if you want to know how salvation is even possible, you can only know the answer through who? Oh, through the Jews. Jesus says to her, in effect, you think you know, but you really don't. You think that by following your traditions or by being loyal to your people or because you've been told for so long that you are right and that everyone else is wrong, that you have the answer. But Jesus says you don't. Who does? The Jews. Even though they get it wrong, even though they will conspire against the very one who, who brings them the salvation that they are proclaiming. Salvation, says Jesus, is from the Jews. You see, throughout history, God never disowned the Jews. He didn't turn his back on them. He remained faithful to his promises. And it's through the Jews that the saviour of the world will be born. And it's through the Jews as they re recorded God's word in, in 66 books. And as they brought these books together in what we call the Bible, it is, is as we open its pages and read of God's promises of salvation and God's faithfulness in bringing about that salvation that men and women will in fact be saved. The Jews may have abandoned God. But God has never abandoned the Jews. God reveals himself to the world through the Jews and then he becomes a Jew. And even here we see something of God's humility, don't we? He, he, he doesn't take on the form of a Roman emperor. That's what I would have done. But not God. What does he do? He takes on the form of a Jew. Not even a significant Jew, but the son of a carpenter. Who can begin to work him out. It's why the Apostle Paul says that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, such as the unsearchable wisdom of God. And so all of the, the presuppositions that this Samaritan woman held are beginning to 
unravel, aren't they, the more that Jesus speaks? It rings true to us too, doesn't it? We think we know something. And as we sit at his feet and as we, as we listen to him, we begin to realise that, that what we thought was true actually wasn't true at all. We begin to understand what truth is, you see, when we listen to him. He's the one who not only brings truth, Jesus defines truth because, because he is truth. Jesus is the very embodiment of truth. And so important is truth that if we really do want to come into God's presence, if we, if we really do want to worship him, we need to have access to the truth. That's what John says. We need to have access to the truth and we need to hold on to the truth. The truth that is held by Jesus. And as we listen to the truth that he brings and as we accept it, the Spirit of God confirms it. And we can then and only then begin to worship. Now there's more that Jesus says here that we need to consider. But, but as time is running away from us, well and truly I think, uh, we'll continue to unpack that a little bit more next week. And I really do hope uh, that you'll choose to join us then. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we do thank you for this wonderful story. We thank you that... Uh, this woman who is so far away from the living God that the living God chose to take a seat beside her and to speak with her and that as he does, the scales began to fall. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone who does not know you and has listened to this message today, that the scales will have begun to fall from their eyes and that you, because you are a God of grace and love, that you would call them into your kingdom as you sit beside them. So bless us as we continue in our worship this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.